Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend, Francis Hunt, the market sniper. Francis, thank you so much for joining us today. Delighted to be with you as ever. Well, we've been talking about for a few months now, um, how you see that there's going to be really an economic reset uh, coming. And what we're seeing right now, just over the weekend, we saw two major banks fail. This is the second and third. These are the second and third largest banks uh, to fail ever in the U.S. Your perspective on that? And is this the beginning, in your opinion, of this reset? Uh, it's a very good question, first of all, and a very topical question. Um, we actually saw technically the small cap financial, S&P small caps. We had this in our charts before all of these eventualities happen. I can flash it when we take a look at gold later. Uh, but yes, this is a serious I was actually almost a little taken back as a foreign national, non-American. Um, you know, that good old Biden got wheeled out uh, and uh, was there to assure that, you know, people have been fired and the taxpayers not paying for this and all, you know, box checking all the things of it's not a bailout. This is very, very clear that they were trying to get that kind of a message across. But the response is very much has been that uh, this is, in fact, potentially a bailout. And I think gold has benefited immensely from this. So again, we go back to first principles. Currency itself is borrowed into existence. Problems in debt markets invariably involve banks and also involve uh, currency. So this has been exceedingly good for the category we've always referred to as anti-fiat. So we've been asserting for the first time in about 18 months, because I have a crypto uh, channel as well, as you're aware, uh, I've called the bottom on Bitcoin at that 15 and a half, and we were looking for a right shoulder, and I've expected it to break what was a critical 25K neckline on a pattern. And at the same time, we've been saying uh, gold and its category are now probably going to break out of that continuation pattern that we've shown you on previous episodes. And we recently did a video highlighting that, in fact, in other currencies, gold is at new highs against the Australian dollar and against the Japanese yen. So very good times, actually, for the anti-fiat category and uh, gold bullion um, buyers as well. And more to come. We definitely have seen precious metals shoot higher, and we've seen incredible demand here at Miles Franklin for the physical metal. Uh, premiums are up. The spot price is up. Um, your perspective on that kind of the rush into metals we've seen amid this concern in the banking system? Uh, and people are correct to be concerned, but the, the, the problem with many people is that they consciously aware that there's a problem, but they continue as they are until they expect. People have this just-in-time mentality. You know, um, yeah, yeah, these gold guys are probably right, but you know what? I'm going to carry on as I need to because I'm making some money in the stock market or I'm, you know, uh, having a bit of a punt on my trading account. I don't want to do all those things. Then when they get a shoe drop event much like this, they go, bang, I'm going to be caught without my uh, metals uh, charge. Uh, and I think over the, and, and I, this is coming from someone who prides himself as a macro technician, uh, who sees charting as very, very useful for timing on any time frame, big time frames and small, that you just can't even risk being uh, slightly wrong on not holding metals because of the, the delays in both ordering, premiums, supply chain, delivery, and various other things. So, but some of these people have, will have noticed this, and uh, and that's led a bit of a charge, and they and they kind of think this could be the thing where the boom drops, and you don't get after a certain point. Uh, and I think that's um, they're playing a dangerous game. Um, they should be net accumulating and should have been doing so uh, throughout, despite being a timer of the market myself. Now, when it comes to the bailout, as you mentioned, you know Biden coming out and saying, you know, this isn't a bailout; the taxpayers aren't paying for it. Well, at the end of the day, if the government is stepping in and, you know, uh, providing funds, you know, it's going to trickle down to the taxpayer eventually here. Uh, we have a viewer asking how many more bailouts before the government has to give up and let the crash happen? Uh, it's a good question, actually. And I would say we're in very much that end of times period. I know many of us have been saying that for a, for a while. Uh, but we we have felt that 2023 is going to be the year where you get serious contagion. 
um, and that could roll into other years. But we expect a lot of shoes uh, to drop. And part of that's also the pressure on the dollar versus other uh, alternatives. So uh, never has the dollar been so much under attack in truth from the bifurcation policies that Biden himself has followed. And just going back to the question uh, that's been asked, how many more? Uh, well, not too many more. And the, uh, when you listen to what they say, I always say they will tell you how they lie to you. Uh, so I have this rather cynical view. And what he was in a great effort to emphasize. So I watched that statement. It wasn't very long. I don't think they can trust Biden with too lengthy a statement. But um, it was very much an emphasis of not a bailout, meaning it is a bailout. As you've quite correctly said, even though they say they're taking from contributions to the from banks to the fund to shore this up, that that is still backwall. Those contributions still need to be there by uh, the taxpayer and everybody else and the banks themselves. If they were un unable to meet them, those funds were used elsewhere. Eventually, you know, you are the backstop. The tax, the American taxpayer, is the end backstop for these irresponsible policies, and. Um, I don't think you've got too much more run. I don't know what size. I think you said, was it yourself, Elijah? I mean, you educated me there. Was it the second largest bank that's ever gone um, bust? The scale is getting big. Yeah, I mean, the so the Silicon Valley Bank was the second largest in the US to ever go bust. And then the um, Signature Bank was the third largest. So we saw those both over the weekend there um, collapsing. So <laughs> a lot of people are concerned that there could be further contagion there one of the, there were a couple uh things going on with those banks uh there's a tie to the u.s bond um the silicon so valley glad you bank that up. right yeah silicon valley bank uh investing in you know very safe assets there <laughs> u.s treasuries but then interest rates go up and those uh the value of those treasuries fall so they have to liquidate those at loss there's also i believe uh in both banks a tie to cryptocurrency your perspective um kind of Such with respect question. to the crypto world, uh, does this impact uh, the cryptocurrencies at all? It, well, it's impacted it positively so far. And we've said the honey badger, that is Bitcoin. We call it the God market for want of a better, the dominant, the bellwether. Uh, and it gets the bulk of the money because it's got the duration. But you've asked such a good question there. And I, I just want to go into some of the detail of it. The, the key part um, that you said, and I remember making a big mention of this very fact, is when they were trying to, uh, in the crypto realm, unravel the backing of the collateral behind these stable coins, um, there was a lot of more disclosure required, more disclosure required. And then they said, we're going to go buy treasuries. Um, and this was, you know, th that is the, you know, almost like the gold plated because it didn't have quite what they had. And now they were committing more and they were doing the best things because previously crypto had even backed crypto with other crypto, which is just a highly volatile basket that tends to be highly correlated as well. In other words, in crashes, it was going down. So from very bad practice to, to further bad practice, because you may not know, but in March 2020, we've said a couple of times with yourself that that was a blow off event in the final peak of the bond market. And we've called a turning in March 2020. In that same year, in August, that was peak bonds. In other words, we're in a hyper stagflationary environment, which means stubbornly high uh, stagflation. So the interest rates are going to be uh, remaining high and very difficult to get down. And any period where you think you've won the battle, they will reassert again. That's the concept of stagflation in a very a low growth environment. So I also mentioned to you before we started, we're actually seeing the likelihood for energies to sell off. We've already called a uh, sub $3 from five plus on natural gas. We're seeing both uranium and uh, oil set up. That's typically demand destroying events and all lots of freedom of movement, like the lockdowns of the March 2020 event. So you've got a lot to unpack, but the turning of the debt market and collateralizing in something that is now peak, you basically you've got a group of people that bought the top of the bond market in a 40 year cycle. They literally showed up as the lights were being switched off and said, I'll have all you've got. You know, and this as collateral was a terrible idea. And I, and I, the, the one example, if I said, what would I have done differently? If they had chosen gold to collateralize instead of bonds, they would not have had any of these events happen to them. If they'd secured precious metals, vaulted it, and even had all the costs and done it personally, instead of, you know, outsourcing this with a reputable 
uh, option, which I'm sure you know many of, uh, they would not have been in this situation. And of course, we then had all the various denials, you know, almost like Peter who had to deny Christ three times, the various denials of inflation to, you know, it's, it's just a bump in the night and, oh, okay, it's carrying on a little while, but it'll pass to the transitory, to the retire transitory, all hell's broken loose, and then fall back to back 0.75 heights, which we've continued to highlight as one of the steepest uh, rate hiking cycle and that things will break. And their, their, their ambivalence in the beginning has turned to belligerence in terms of fighting uh, inflation. So having been late to react they now are doubly determined to be extra vigilant until the events that now threatened uh, on the banking system. And of course, there was a tie to crypto. However, Bitcoin has endured such incredible fear um, and uh, bad news. We've had all sorts of uh, downside that actually it's going up on bad news. And that is a classic sign of a bottoming market. Uh, now, there will be some people here that don't uh, trust uh, crypto, and I fully get that. I don't fully trust it. I don't think Bitcoin is necessarily fully decentralized, and I'm not trying to provoke people by that. But in my personal opinion, this market has turned because actually you've had bad news of on-ramping banks that are being um, closed down and actually you're seeing this entity going up. That is saying that in the voting machine that is the market, when you contemplate, um, do you want to hold something that is fixed in issuance number 21 million, or do you want to take on and hold fiats in either banks, which are going bust, with debt that has turned and the bond market is over, or in currencies that are the other half, the dark side of the moon, currencies to the debt system. These are equally big. And people have said no to all three of those. No to banks, no to debt, and no to the currencies, which are existing system. And they're going to buy the entity uh, like Bitcoin and, of course, gold, uh, and both of them, uh, rather than seeing an adversarial role, they're both going up in the anti-fiat category, and I'm really happy about that. We are seeing quite a spike in uh, Bitcoin right now. Your perspective on that, because it seems like there's been, as you mentioned, a lot of bad news. There's been the FTX scandal. There's been you know these banks' ties to cryptocurrencies. Um, one of the arguments that I've heard is that, you know, the the FTX scandal actually created a lot more regulation, and now cryptocurrencies may be safer in the future. So it might actually, in in the end, be uh, a good thing for cryptocurrencies. But uh, your take on Bitcoin right now? I'll give you a technical take on why I think it's going up, but that wouldn't be answering the fullness of what you actually asked. What you actually ask is, um, it has FTX and the 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 bad news events led to? Um, a, a better environment. So my overall opinion, and I will always say this is they, and you can decide who they is for yourself. Uh, it's not for me to project on you, but they will never let you have your own money. So from either inception um, or very soon after inception, for me, I think uh, large parts of Bitcoin has been taken under control by whoever the people that control money in the world, uh, whoever you assign that to is there. The, the whole game of power, um, the great quote by uh, Rothschild about, I care not who makes the laws if I control the issuance of money is the key thing. That would be the ultimate power that would make you uncontrollable if you minted your own money. Uh, and this is why we are natural gold, precious metals, truth seekers, uh, libertarians, and the one thing they had to capture first when they created Bitcoin is they created, for me, I think a myth. It's a bit of a Santa Claus uh, story with a Satoshi Nakamoto. I don't have a dog in the fight. I'm not going to set out to prove it. Maybe there was a guy by that name. Who knows? I, I don't care too much. But the whole notion of this very benevolent founder that created all this wealth, did all this work and disappeared into the ether not to be seen to, uh, again and gifted this great thing. Um, it, do it doesn't sound uh, very much like it. When you look into the NSA in 1996, where they had a similar non-gold um, money, you've also got to remember the, the e-gold, the, how they closed that gentleman down, who actually was not doing anything fraudulent. He actually had the metals for every e-dollar he issued against uh, secured gold. They, they come down hard on things they don't control. So we are in a control mechanism. You've got to be in their money system. Um, so Bitcoin for me is 
is no doubt controlled. However, they need to officially control it at the headline level. And for now, they've pretended that it's this Wild West that they have no uh, jurisdiction over. And now they seek to gain that. And you see, because the adults aren't in the room, someone's stolen your money at FTX. Well, unfortunately, regulation didn't stop Bernie Madoff. It hasn't stopped uh, Corzine of MF Global. It hasn't stopped a lot of things. In fact, it makes doing business transactionally harder. It makes it more expensive. It gives surveillance and regulatory control to a group of bodies that I don't think that have your best interests at heart. Uh, crooks will crook and they'll crook in any industry. And to some extent, the likes of Mashinsky and SBF look like a certain profile of crooks that were almost set up there to herd the sheep into that regulatory abattoir. Um, so it almost seems as if it was gamified. So I don't see um, FTX's events as being positive. I don't see the regulation as being positive. I'd prefer to be out in the frontier as a libertarian, a cowboy. I'm speaking to a man in America, um, you know, how the West was won. You know, uh, generally, uh, it was better days back then, and you paid a lot less tax, and people left you alone a lot more. Uh, for want of uh, getting a bullet if they didn't. So, uh, But I'm going to show you the chart and give you a technical response as to why Bitcoin will be interesting to build further on that. I do think it's going to be allowed to go up for a while. My one big long-term concern is for how long? Because when the central bank digital currencies come, the one great quote that I take to be truth is, uh, competition is sin. They are not true capitalists. The people that I'm referring to, in my opinion, are not true capitalists. They don't want competition of service long term. They want a variety of different brands that they all control. Um, and uh, I do feel the features of Bitcoin will see it be a little bit too freedom orientated, uh, especially if they plan to have timeouts and various other things on money through the central bank digital token. So just, just for those that have like a chart, this is why I think a key event has occurred, not just for gold, but also for now for uh, Bitcoin. And that is this pattern structure. And it's one of the, the uh, one of the most consistent uh, pattern structures for reversals. And it's a big time frame. I put a two day chart on there. If you can see up top there, let me just get my draw tool out the way there. Um, and it is it is uh, inverted head and shoulder. It is basically the opposite of a normal head and shoulder, which is usually a cyclical top. What you when you get the corollary, it's usually a cyclical bottom. And you also should get volume that supports the move and clear signs of momentum. So if I just pop on here and indulge me on the charting side uh, volume, you'll see that the volume has started to pick up. You get capitulative final volume in the selling. We came in really hard on the 25,000. 25,000 law of round numbers, by the way. So you also got to remember that there's a derivative market on Bitcoin and strike prices are usually at round numbers. A key round number for this price point is one quarter of the way to 100,000, $25,000. Uh, and that is then your left shoulder. We were actually involved warning people not to chase in. This is the first time I've reverted quite high conviction bull on any level for the last 18 months, almost two years on Bitcoin. We warned people don't get giddy here. You're likely to get sold out on that rising wedge. That was the first failure to get back above 25K. You've then made this larger head. You came back up recently. And we warned people in a YouTube, there's likely to be a little bit of a spill first before you go. So we were forward scenario casting that this event would occur. And we say the final confirmation of a triggering event is an impulsive break of the 25,000 level. And that has absolutely happened. And before it, we also showed that you were a little bit broadening and there needed to be a further sell-off. So in our video, we said there's going to be an opportunity to buy at the key 20K. And the reason this was an interesting level uh, is that it was the legacy high of 2017. You see, I have two blue lines, the 20,000 and the legacy high of 19,800, whatever it was, dollars. And we broke through that basing ascending guideline. So there was a megaphone on a bull pole. Uh, and that's where we've come. So this is a key event. And note the momentum as well, Elijah. 
This is a real snapback. So you smashed down hard, you went up slowly, but now you've gone down fairly firmly, but you've come back even harder and on growing volume. But a lot of people are so battered in the crypto space, they haven't yet realized it. And that means it's still fairly early doors. And that's good for gold too, because they move as a category. That's very interesting how they move it as a category sometimes. I did want to ask you about uh, cryptocurrency kind of in this new system we've talked about. You said in a previous interview that you know precious metals are a great way to transition wealth if we do see some sort of reset into a new uh, currency system. What about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin? Is that another vehicle in your mind that will survive? I think it's worth a try. I think you should never... I my, one of my favorite sayings when people were also, particularly in the crypto space, saying, I'm 99% all in, you know, as if this was a virtue of the extent of their conviction and their manliness. It's far better to have a, a stable of horse than one fast horse. Um, and that just gives you more varieties. And there's horses for courses. Sometimes you need pulling something up a hill and sometimes you need a racehorse. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm for having uh, spread in it about a bit, you know, inside the precious metals category and also for digital. But the one thing that concerns me about digitized wealth, even digitized created scarcity, is that you can break the rule, you can break the remit, you can change the code and say, no, we'll have 60 million instead. Um, now, I'm not saying that makes sense and that would be easy to do, but digital scarcity is one kind of scarcity. Uh, a real, real build a, a mine, dig a hole in the ground and have a whole bunch of goes and get people to back you for money and make sure you've done your geostatistics right so that you can find that rarity that is gold or silver, different level of uh, conviction there for me. So I'm okay with digital uh, scarcity to a degree, but your portfolio should reflect that. Uh, so for me, it's the fast horse, it's the fast and furious high volatility one, and it'll be a smaller percentage holding by some way, whilst gold, as I say, it's proven over millennia. You know, everyone goes, Bitcoin's been around now, you know, a decade or so. It has been created since quantitative easing became a thing. It is yet to see, you know, the real downturns. Essentially, it was birthed in 0910, uh, and it's just been uh, QE and low rates, low interest rate environment. We are now going into a higher interest rate environment. And of course, these arms are trying to get control over it, and they have ambitions for a very similar product. They don't have an alternative for gold. You know, they haven't made a special metal. That is super unique, has all the unique properties of conductivity, you know, uh, never corrodes, et cetera, et cetera, that they haven't done. So I would still put uh, metals, and, I'm, and, I, and I think we should bring you up a gold chart, and I highlight to everybody, gold on many fiats on, is now moving through those uh, higher into new highs against Australian and the yen, and is not far away against currencies like the pound and a number of others. So it will come for gold too. It seems like it is coming for gold um, as we see gold, you know, hitting new highs in many currencies. I did want to get your perspective again on what we're seeing kind of coming full circle um, here for the economy here in the U.S. Uh, and the banking system. If we look kind of longer term, your at anticipation of how these higher interest rates, as you mentioned, are going to impact the system. We're already seeing, you know, banks fail largely because of these higher interest rates, at least for Silicon Valley Bank. Um, many people have said the full effect of the Fed raising rates has not been uh, not been seen yet. So can you expand on kind of the further effects you see of even the interest rate hikes they've already done? hundred percent. It's a, and again, it's a very good question. And in part of it, you you're almost half answering it. Such rapid increases, you do not, from one rate increase to another, truly see the impact of that. For example, um, you might have a fixed rate mortgage, um, Elijah, but now I understand you're moving offices. Imagine you were selling your old place and buying at a new place. You'd have to fund at whatever the then fund rate is. But not everybody is initially in that situation. So you only have a very small percentage that are affected by this. But there's also, as we said, 70% of commercial property. I see commercial property as absolute 
train smash and there's 70 percent that needs refunding and refinancing so more people working from home uh, the the downdraft of march 2020 is very much um you know remote working and all of this a massive downswing on commercial property and a, a massive upswing in the costs therein so i i see a lot of commercial reits i see that's a very bad space i mentioned to you energies are typically a barometer of economic activity. I call it the Rockefeller tax. Um, when we were having the super house boom of 07, we actually had the highest oil prices. And that's how they skim some of the largesse of your newfound wealth in that uh, equity of your property going up. Uh, and when we are really squeezed and the consumer is really squeezed, that oil price drops significantly down. So it's in plastics packaging and everything. So by being bearish in the energies, which included uranium and, as I say, natural gas already substantially down, and actually coincidentally, because they're all in dollars, being bullish Bitcoin and gold, we actually have this segmentization of currency alternative money uh, and gold is real money and bitcoin is as far as it can be digital gold um, in that sense we're seeing this category do rather well the only other thing that's going up i'm afraid elijah is the military industrial complex when i look at their equities there so i don't think this uh, downturn in oil is because of sudden peace in russia and ukraine so i'm trying to guess i'm making technical conclusions and trying to guess what the news would be because this is kind of what happened with um uh, the events of march 2020 i thought what's killing cruise liners that's also killing uh, the oil price because surely it's, it's one of its biggest costs and then we got the answer it was a pandemic uh, and in this event i'm looking and it seems the military industrial complex is one of the rare hot spots uh, to, to go up and we're seeing energies down. So that points to consumer and retail based real recession, I would argue potentially depression. And that can trickle through losses through banks. Um, it could point to stock market revaluations to the downside. We've got a very strong valued uh, equity market. I've been making the case that per capita and by um, GDP of market a uh, market cap total market cap of all the major stock exchanges America carries a massive weight of equity in stock markets at this at a point that the the, the peak the, the the bell curve boomer is now pivoted into retirement so you know you're getting um those guys are now wanting to sell stocks downgrade homes uh fund Medicaid and uh, medical events and are less prone to expenditure, um, are not earning, are less prone to paying taxation, uh, and are now in their retirement years. So demographically, everything is pointing to a down a downdraft. And this is part of the stagflation. It's going to be stubbornly difficult to get economic growth, and it's going to be stubbornly high on the inflation. So you're getting the inverse Goldilocks effect that the Greenspan era alleged to bequest you as a gift. And uh, I'm afraid that you can't have the brightest sunny days without a dark night. And I think we're going to be walking the dark night uh, for the, econo the economy. And I think some people will be seizing that opportunity to introduce plans that they've always had. And that's my slight problem with Bitcoin. We have a target of 40K on this inverted head and shoulder that I showed you. What happens after that if the demand destroying event continues to accelerate, we could get contraction, and then there could be announcements, and then there could be, I don't want to say make it legal, or there could be all forms of regulate or register your ownership and pay tax and all of this. And, and suddenly, you know, uh, some of the attractiveness could be stolen from Bitcoin. I don't see it as easy with gold. You literally have to visit people and take it off them because it can be physically held. And before I let you go, Francis, looking at this economic environment that we're heading into it sounds like a severe recession stagflation uh how do people prepare i know we've been over this before but if you could kind of walk our viewers uh through kind of what they should be thinking about uh in their financial lives right now yes perversely cash is still good to have because you're going to buy things for significantly less so inside even though stagflation implies costs rising and stubborn inflation within that you're getting these massive dips uh where where there's just no demand and stock has to be let go uh, and people have to li liquidate and forced sellers 
the, you, this is the, the tide going out and people being caught naked. And those that are over leveraged are going to be flushed out and you're going to get ridiculous prices. So actually, when there's blood in the street, there's also opportunity. Somebody else's blood, unfortunately, is your opportunity. So to buy a property after a major demand destroying event, say March 2020 during um uh, the COVID events or 2009, for example, uh, post subprime actually was an incredible opportunity to actually pick out. So having cash to exploit that, and of course, certain equities. So if uranium comes off, et cetera, et cetera, or oil shares again, dip again, um, there's going to be real opportunity. So the volatility hurts those that are leveraged and doesn't hurt the patients that are under leveraged and have cash resources. So I'd say one of the best things you should have, and I'm preaching to the converted in terms of gold, so I don't need to mention that, I'm sure, gold and silver, but um, definitely cash, I would say, is the next best thing. And much more you don't need to do, apart from preparation around self-reliance and security and the home and family and the community. That's never a bad investment, Elijah. Definitely. Building community is always a good investment. Francis, if our viewers are interested in learning more, where can they find you? And did you have any last thoughts? Yes, well, we've got, uh, we are trading this event to the downside. We've got a cluster of equities that we've chosen with real technical structures. Um, as a, as uh, our opinion is that this was a key event for Bitcoin and that you could see 40,000 subsequent to this 25K break and that, you know, may people utilize that, but don't get over leveraged. There can always be a revisit to a neckline in a technical structure. So be, you know, limit orders are your friend and moderate sizing. The move makes you the money. And this is, we teach this in the community and we look after it and we, we're uh, basically highlighting a large amount of shorts. We short Pfizer. I think some people might like that big head and shoulders. So we see these things technically and we've been in, in them for a while. And that is a way to help build wealth in the system. But I would say there's always counterparty risk. Pop over to our, the market sniper, have a friendly chat. We have a, very well supported by the American um, community. In fact, the entire North American community with Canadians and Americans as well, um, as well as people from all around the world. Uh, and we'd love to help you build wealth and turn that into bullion uh, through Miles Franklin as well in due course. All right. Well, Francis, we really appreciate uh, your time today. We'll put a link in the description of this video uh, to your uh, website themarketsniper.com, also your YouTube channel, The Market Sniper One. Uh, Francis, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on again.